Welcome to this lecture about feline infectious peritonitis. In part two, we'll cover diagnosis, treatment and prevention. So let me introduce you to Meg, a one-year-old female neutered ragdoll who was obtained from the breeder as a kitten. She's with you today because the owners have noticed a change in her eye colour and they also report that she's been a bit quiet and off her food recently. When you examine Meg, she's thin with a body condition score of 2 out of 5. Her mucous membranes are pale and icteric like the tortoise shell cat on the right. Her temperature is 39.9 so she's pyrexic and she's got anterior uveitis and high femur causing the eye colour change like the grey cat on the right. So, so far Meg's problem list is lethargy, poor condition which we can put down to her not wanting to eat, pale mucous membranes, icterus, pyrexia and ocular signs. So the lethargy and poor condition are a bit too vague to investigate, but thinking about the pale mucous membranes, if she's also got a normal capillary refill time, we can say that she's anemic. And my next question would be whether her anemia is regenerative or non-regenerative. Her icterus could either be prehepatic, hepatic or posthepatic. Pyrexia suggests that there's infection or inflammation going on. And I'd wonder whether her ocular signs are part of the same disease process or just totally unrelated. So a few differentials that would be going around in my head would be dry FIP, because this is an FIP lecture, hemolytic anemia, um, so that would explain both the anemia and the icterus, so a kind of prehepatic icterus, um, cholangitis or hepatitis, so something involving the liver and biliary tract, and then I'd also be thinking about other reasons for her ocular signs, like um, idiopathic or traumatic uveitis. So I'd really want to find out what kind of anemia is going on, and I'd want to check whether there's any evidence of hemolysis, so I could try and figure out what kind of icterus is going on as well. So Meg's blood work showed a mild non-regenerative anemia. Um, this is typical of chronic disease, so it doesn't really tell us what's going on, but it does rule out hemolysis and therefore a prehepatic icterus. Um, so this means her icterus is either hepatic or posthepatic. So in order to investigate her liver and her biliary tract, I'd want to do an ultrasound. Um, so this is what's done. Uh, this is what was done. So her liver and biliary tract, um, no, no changes were visible. However, on the ultrasound, her mesenteric lymph nodes were found to be enlarged. And there was also a small volume of free fluid in the abdomen. Um, so this fluid was sampled and it was found to be completely typical of an FIP effusion. And we'll talk a little bit more about the characteristics of an FIP effusion in a moment. So because, um, because the macrophages were negative for coronavirus antigen, we couldn't go for a definitive diagnosis. However, with all this evidence in place, it's strong enough for a presumptive diagnosis of FIP. So diagnosis of FIP, um, as you might have gathered, is very difficult to do definitively. Um, so often what will happen, so it's only possible if you can find coronavirus antigen in fluid or tissue, tissue macrophages, that's the only way to do it. Um, but a definitive diagnosis isn't necessary, so often what you'll do is come up with a strong presumptive diagnosis. And this will be based on signalment, the history, the physical exam findings, and a few carefully chosen supportive diagnostic tests, which we'll talk about now. So haematology and biochemistry um, is a really good place to start, especially if you've got signs like anemia and icterus, um, it can give you more information about what's going on. So you'll find things like a mild non-regenerative anemia, um, lymphocytopenia is quite, quite typical of FIP as well. Um, you've often got a hyper globulinemia and if you did serum electrophoresis you'd find this is a gamma globulinemia so this represents a lot of antibodies kicking around in the blood. Um, the albumin globulin ratio if it's above 0 0.8 that pretty much rules out FIP. Below 0 0.8 um, again provides evidence but it's not definitive. Um, alpha 1 acid glycoprotein is an acute phase protein so it just tells you that there's active inflammation going on. Um, again, it's supportive, but it's not definitive. So um, analysis of effusions is the easiest, quickest, least invasive way to reach either a definitive or a very strong presumptive diagnosis. So 
if you can't find a fusion on physical exam, it's still really important to use ultrasound and x-ray to look for one. So this might be in the abdomen, the thorax, the pericardium, even the scrotum, um, if it's an intact male. But just keep on looking for that effusion and when you find it, sample it. Because there are very few differentials to explain a, an effusion um, with the typical characteristics of FIP, especially if it's in more than one body cavity. So. These are the typical characteristics. So it will be a yellow, clear to cloudy, um, viscous, ex non septic exudate. Um, it's quite low cellularity, but quite high protein. Um, it's got a very low albumin to globulin ratio. If you were to carry out a coronavirus PCR, um, you'd find it was positive and the virus levels would be quite high. Um, immunostaining, as I said, so finding coronavirus within macrophages is the only way to come up with a definitive diagnosis. Um, but bear in mind that if it's negative, it doesn't mean that you don't have FIP. So you can still come up with a strong presumptive diagnosis of FIP just based on all these other factors. So there's a nice gold star just to demonstrate how it's actually really a very gold standard type technique um, to come up with an FIP diagnosis. So if you can't find an effusion, the only option you've got for a definitive diagnosis is a surgical biopsy, histopathology and immunostaining. So surgical biopsy is more sensitive than core needle or FNA um, and you can sample either the lymph nodes or effective or affected organs. So this will usually be things like the liver, spleen or kidneys. The lesion that you'll find is pyogranulomatous inflammation and um, the PCR can be carried out on tissue. Um, again, high levels of virus will contribute to a supportive diagnosis, but it isn't definitive. The only thing that is, is finding um, coronavirus antigen within tissue macrophages. However, bear in mind, um, doing a surgical biopsy, usually involving an x lap opening up the abdomen and actually you know, handling the organs and that sort of thing, isn't necessarily in the best interest of a sick cat. So if you've got lots of evidence to support a diagnosis of FIP, don't feel pressured into doing a surgical biopsy to get that definitive diagnosis. Um, coronavirus serology and PCR, so de basically detecting coronavirus antibody or antigen in the blood. Um, not particularly useful, so a lot of people do it, but all it tells you is that you've got um, antibodies against coronavirus. It doesn't tell you whether it's FECV or FIPV, so it um, doesn't really tell you anything about the current or future status of FIP in that particular cat. And because FECV is so ubiquitous, a lot of cats will be seropositive, um, so it doesn't really help you in that sense. Um, as I said, healthy cats can have high antibody titers or virus levels, and FIP cats in some cases can actually have um, no antibodies against coronavirus, so it can be quite, quite confusing and misleading in some ways. Um, fecal coronavirus PCR, so this, this tells you if the cat's actively shedding coronavirus in the faeces. Um, again, not useful for diagnosis. It doesn't differentiate between FECV and FIPV, um, some cats with FIP don't shed any coronavirus in the faeces. So forget about these tests for diagnosis. Um, they can be useful for a kind of prevention strategy, which we'll talk about a bit later, but don't bother with them for the diagnosis. They're a waste of time and money. So big no entry sign to remind you of that. So with Meg, um, a diagnosis of FIP was made. Um, as you probably know, FIP is invariably fatal, so an awful, awful diagnosis and prognosis to have to tell somebody. Um, median survival time post-diagnosis is nine days, and it can come as a huge shock to the owners, because um, often the cats seem quite well, and they really weren't expecting such terrible news from you. Um, so the main, the main thing you really have to deal with on diagnosing FIP is counselling the owners, so talking to them um, helping them to come to terms with the diagnosis and come up with an ongoing plan that they're happy with without really giving them false hope. That's the main thing. So um, palliative treatment is a huge part of that. Um, often people will decide on euthanasia on diagnosis, but if they don't and they want to take the cat home um, and the quality of life is good enough at that point, 
then you'd want to think about prednisolone. So um, that's often used just to kind of um, alleviate some of the clinical signs. Obviously, it won't cure the disease. Um, you also have to consider adequate calorie intake and hydration, that sort of thing. Just really good palliative care. Um, there are other treatment options available, but none of them have proven efficacy. And my concern would be that they're expensive, they have potentially dangerous side effects, and they are almost giving false hope to the owners. So I don't really think they're worthwhile. I think it's more important to focus on having a really frank discussion with the owners about the prognosis and about quality of life. And then just if you are going to keep the cat alive um, for some time, thinking about um, palliative care and when to call it a day. Since FIP is such a horrible disease with such a horrible outcome, um, I guess the big question we'd be thinking about is can we prevent it? So with difficulty, but there are options. So there's a vaccine available, not in the UK, um, but in America and some European countries. However, it's not particularly effective. Um, and it can't be given before 16 weeks. So cats usually are exposed to coronavirus by the time they're vaccinated anyway. So it's of very limited use. Um, we've got the option of maintaining a coronavirus free environment. So this would involve um, testing all cats. So using serology to test cats. Um, any with antibodies to coronavirus would have to be separated or potentially cold. Um, those who are antibody negative would have to be continually tested with um, the faecal PCR to make sure that they aren't kind of in the early stages of, of um, feline enteric coronavirus. So it's possible, and some breeders do it. So you can get F you can get FIP free kittens. Um, it is a thing. However, you have to think about how realistic it is to kind of maintain that in a home environment. So it would mean the cat would have to stay indoors wouldn't be able to mix with other cats. Um, if there was already a cat in the, ho in the household, it would also have to be tested um, initially with serology and then with faecal PCR to make sure that it's also coronavirus free. Um, probably a more common sense approach and something that everybody can achieve is good husbandry leading to stress reduction and reduction of viral load in the environment. So this is gonna be things like preventing overcrowding, providing plenty of bowls, litter trays and hiding places, environmental enrichment, allowing cats to go outdoors, good hygiene, good preventative health care. Um, it's all just really common sense things to try to improve the welfare of the animals, reduce stress and improve hygiene, so reduce environmental load as well. And um, put a nice gold star on that one as well, just to remind you that that's a really good um, prevention option to go for. Obviously it won't completely prevent FIP from developing, there's always the risk, um, but it does greatly reduce that risk. So the outcome for Meg, um, had a really frank chat with the owners, talked about trigger points. So um, these are really important, it's really important when you talk about a cat with a terminal illness um, to come up with trigger points. So points that the cat reaches when the owners will say, okay, enough, time for euthanasia. So this might be things like complete loss of appetite, further weight loss, not wanting to interact with the owners. Um, there's all sorts of things you can decide on and it's quite personal to the cat and to the owners. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really important to talk about those and decide on those at this point rather than further down the line. Um, she was given prednisolone and was tempted to eat with her favorite foods. And then, unfortunately, she had to come back for euthanasia after she completely stopped eating and um, suffered from further weight loss. So with these sorts of cases, it doesn't make much sense to book a follow-up consult because the, the kind of progress of the disease can be so variable, such an awful, awful prognosis, and we kind of all know what's going to happen eventually. So um, I would recommend if the owners are taking the cat home, have that conversation first about quality of life and trigger points and then um, give them a call maybe two days later just to see how the cat's doing, kind of reinforce those ideas, reinforce the trigger points and make sure they're still on board with all of that. So to summarise, FIP is a fatal disease of young cats. Um, it can have extremely variable clinical signs. 
um, it can be a very difficult disease to diagnose definitively. And sometimes, um, because the prognosis is so awful, you really feel like you need to go for that definitive diagnosis. However, have the confidence to go for a, a strong presumptive diagnosis and always remember to think of the cat's welfare. So don't go for surgical biopsies if it's not in the cat's best interest. You've got um, other vets in your practice, you've got the lab, you've got referral centres and you can talk to all these people for advice if you're ever unsure about the diagnosis um, or any aspects of, of FIP. So treatment really just involves counselling the owners, having a really, um, a really frank discussion about quality of life and also palliative care for the cat if you do decide that um, to keep it going for a little while. And prevention of the disease is best achieved through good common sense husbandry. So thanks for listening. Um, if you want any more information about FIP, do have a look at these references.